What's going on, everybody? I'm Aslan Hudjavandi, joined by Irish O'Fell, our managing editor over at Warchant.com, and senior writer Corey S. Clark. Hit the thumbs up button. Show some appreciation for the hard work these gentlemen do. I just get to hang out with them, right on their coattails. It's awesome, everybody. Kids, surround yourself with talented people. I'll take you to the top. Subscribe button's in the lower right corner of your screen. Hit that, Warchant.com, promo code Warchant30, 30, 30 free days. We're here to talk about baseball. You probably thought you were getting some football content. That'll, that'll be coming soon, but we've got to talk about baseball. The season has come to a conclusion, obviously, in Auburn this past weekend when they lost to UCLA in the Auburn Regional. Corey, you wrote a column about kind of where the direction of this program goes. How do you assess things moving forward? I guess my question to you, reading your column, which is over at Warchant.com for our subscribers, when the same sort of errors, the same sort of mistakes, the same sort of identity, maybe it's some sort of culture that's been created here by Mike Martin Jr. keeps showing itself over and over. Uh, what is the future of the program then? How can things change right now with what Mike Martin Jr. is working with? Well, number one, get better players. Uh, that always helps. Uh, fi figure out how you're teaching base running and how you're teaching fielding and just scrap those pieces of paper or whatever those plans are and burn them. Maybe have a ritual where you burn, you, you burn every game plan you've ever had when it comes to base running and fielding because they've been awful for a while. But, you know, look, man, next year is is the year. I mean, if this happens again next year, I don't know. What, and, and again, not only does, do, do they do they not base run well and they not field well, th this year they were terrible at hitting. Um, but if, if that continues next year, with the, even if they get some great hitters, if the fielding and the base running is still what it's been, let's focus on the fielding for now, and they still can't pick up the baseball, which he said they were going to do better than, they, than they've done in recent years, that has not happened. Uh, that certainly didn't happen this year, either. Even when two transfers into the infield, um, you know, he's then then you have you have to have some real discussions because I you can get a two year grace period, which is what this has been. I know it's his third year, but he's had two seasons. If it, this if the if it looks the exact same and it's another mediocre, barely getting into the tournament, or God forbid, missing the tournament, then you have to have some real conversations because right now, Ira, I think you would agree. I don't think this program is in any better shape than it was when Meat took over for his dad. Um, it's not any worse shape necessarily, but it hasn't. It certainly isn't climbing. It hasn't progressed like we'd have hoped it would through uh, through two full seasons. Yeah, I mean, I think the one thing that they they have done, I think he tried to do it later uh, in his dad's tenure when he kind of took more of an active role in recruiting, uh, was to try to get more power arms. You know, for years Florida State had a lot of, you know, crafty left-handers and crafty right-handers. I mean, they didn't have a lot of power arms, and they've changed that, and they've got more power arms now. Um, but going into the season, you know, Mike Martin Jr. thought this was going to be the number one pitching staff in the country. I mean, he had no question about it, how good this uh, – lauding how good this pitching staff was going to be, and it was okay. I mean, it was decent. It was good, but it wasn't unbelievable. And it certainly wasn't enough to get this team to where, uh, you know, Florida State fans want it to be. So – um, especially with all the other deficiencies. So I think one area where they have gotten better is they've gotten more power arms. Um, but, but from other, you know, the fielding issues, which have been getting worse and worse and worse, as you said, under Mike Martin Sr.'s tenure, uh, and also the base running issues just can get compounded. But now what's happened is the hitting has gone completely. And, and that, to me, is the, probably the most concerning thing is because there's, there's really nothing to hang their hat on. If, unless they're shutting teams out, uh, they haven't been able to really have anything to hang their hat on. And then you look at what you're going to be losing from this pitching staff going into next year. And, you know, it's understandable why fans are very concerned. Corey, I mean, what can you do for Michael Alford? I mean, it, it's two full seasons, but he's gone three years into his four-year contract. 2023 is the final year of his contract. I don't know how base – I think baseball recruiting varies differently than, than football recruiting. I think you probably aren't going to get too stung on the trail – by saying that maybe you're a lame duck. But, I mean, what can you do right now, I guess, if you're meat to change things other than players, and if you're Michael Alford, what can you really do at this juncture, you think, by assessing the baseball program? And can you address anything if you're the athletic director right now? Well, look, yeah, it might be tough to go recruit when you don't have a year left on when, when you're in your final year of your contract. You can always extend them an extra year. And if it doesn't work out, I mean, look, man, you're not paying them $90 million. You can afford $400,000 if it doesn't work out, if you if you give him an extra year in your, on your contract, that will not serve that will not save meat if they have a bad season in twenty in twenty three. Um, but it, it would help him on the trail for this year for portal kids, young portal kids, and going into next year. I, I think if I was the AD, 
I would probably give him another year or give him a year onto his contract, knowing that it doesn't guarantee he'd be there in 2024. It just doesn't. If they're bad in 2023, you might have to make a change, and then you eat four hundred thousand dollars, which isn't the you know the end of the world. Um, so that and as far as as Mike Martin Jr. goes, you've got. I mean, I don't know. You might have to make some major. You have to might shake up the the coaching staff. I mean, I just. It's not like they were hard luck losers. It's not like they had a great season and they just got ousted like Lonnie's team did in softball. They were up and down, mediocre all season, and then they went to Auburn and played like they had all season. Looked pretty good for a game. Terrible for a game, decent in another game, but lost a close one. I mean, that's just what they do. So it's when you're when you're grading the program, it's not just about what happened in Auburn. It's what ha- it's what happened the last two regular seasons, and they've just been average, nothing special at all, and no real trend that it's getting better. So I don't know what Mike Martin Jr. can do other than pulling in. Even incredible recruiting classes don't matter because half of them might get drafted anyway. If he has a big summer in the portal then maybe that, that that can certainly help things. But other than that, it's got to be a prove it to me come next February, man. Prove it to me that this team can field better and run the bases better and actually hit for power and get on base. All the things that you want a baseball team to do. Ira, if you're Michael Lawford, are, are you taking Meets agent's phone calls or are you just telling your secretary, I'm, I'm not here, I'm not here right now? <laughs> I think there's got definitely conversations going on uh, for sure. I mean, I think Mike Lawford – is a baseball guy. He played college baseball at Mississippi State and uh, UAB, I believe. And, uh, you know, so he's obviously going to have his own opinions, but I'm sure he wants to hear from Mike Martin Jr. what he thinks uh, can be done. There are some signs of promise in terms of, from a recruiting standpoint, a couple of their best players are young guys. Tibbs, Ferrer are big time hitters, uh, and they hit well all season. They've also got, they've got other arms still on the staff, even with whoever ends up leaving this year. And they've recruited really well. I mean, they've been recruiting well the last couple of years. So I think there's, there's talent coming uh, to this program. Uh, the question is, again, I mean, it's just why are the problems, as Corey said, the problems we're seeing, why don't they ever get fixed? And, and, and what are you going to do to get them fixed? I don't know. Maybe, you know, when Mike Metcalf came in as recruiting coordinator, Mike Martin Jr. stayed as the hitting coach. Maybe you need to figure out a way to have a full-time hitting coach or hire somebody on the staff as a special assistant. I mean, Auburn had you know, a bunch of major leaguers on their – Tim Hudson's a volunteer assistant, but he's their pitching coach. Can you find a hitting coach who can also maybe be a volunteer assistant? Uh, they've got to be more resourceful and figure out a way to help this staff because, uh, to me, I don't think this was a great roster. And I know you guys made that point on Wake Up that this is not a great roster and it's that maybe they've overcome some deficiencies. I don't think they played better than the sum of their parts. I think they could have gotten a lot more out of what they have, and that goes to coaching. And so – I. I agree with Corey. I don't think there's a big rush to make a change right now, but I understand why fans are impatient. And I think if you're Michael Offord, you want to hear solutions from Mike Martin Jr. how he's going to fix it. Corey, what's more maddening to you? The fact that Meat had the luxury of, for all intents and purposes, being the head coach in waiting, um, and, and this is kind of you know where we're at at this juncture. He had this sort of lead up, and he hasn't been able to take advantage of it. Or is it the fact that you see a guy like Link Jarrett in South Bend presumably a guy that would have been in the mix for this job, look like an absolute rock star right now. Maybe you and, and, and the, the pulse of the fans, if you will, what do you think is the more frustrating of those two kind of things right now? Well, I, I kind of think they go hand in hand because the point you can make is, okay, we get it. It is hard to like, and again, I, I want to point out like I did in the column. I know that Mike Martin Sr.'s last team made the College World Series. That was one of the last four teams to get into the tournament. They had a great run in June, which more power to them. But that was not a good team either. This program was not – it had a great two-week run, a special two-week run to get, get him to Omaha one last time, which was magical. Felt like destiny, and then, of course, they stopped scoring. But either way, that happened. But the season also happened, and that was not a good baseball team in 2019. It had a good two-week stretch. And so you look here, and it's, it's – nothing has really changed as far as the, the – I would say the talent level, other than Ira mentioned the, the power arms. They do have power arms. Now, Mark Montgomery and, and Bowmeister, you're probably two most powerful arms. Neither one of them could figure out to, how to pitch in the, in the postseason at all. So lot, fat load of good that did you. But you, you, you wonder like, okay, why, why can – I know it, takes, it can take a while to build a program from mediocre to good or, or good to great. But Link Jarrett did it in a, in a pretty quick amount of time too. Now, he took over a team that was – he won with a lot of guys, players that he didn't recruit. But he turned that around. He turned that whole culture, that whole program around, and now they're in a super regional after you know hovering around the top ten all season. And so that can be maddening to Florida State fans too. Is okay, you can't tell me 
that it's really hard. It's harder to turn around Florida State than it is Notre Dame. You know what I mean? Like you just you have more advantages in Tallahassee, Florida, um, the locale, the weather, the people you get to recruit than than Notre Dame does, and yet they've been better than you now, really, since you've taken the job. And that is an FSU guy. So yeah, I can see how that would be that would be frustrating too. Again, we're two years in. And you you can say be patient, and I am trying to be patient. I wrote a column to be patient. But when you look around and see other teams having better and more immediate success, and I'm not talking about the postseason, I'm talking about the regular season. That's what baseball to me is a regular season sport. That's how you can judge the the strength of a program um, and get a feel for the program. And right now, this team is an up and down kind of Jekyll and Hyde type team, and it has been that way all season, the last two seasons. It's kind of a you know, you don't know what you're going to get. It's it's in the only thing inc- consistent about it is, is inconsistency, and that's not one out of a, that's not what you want out of a baseball program. Ira, the thing though is, I mean, Corey, it's it's more than year three, man. I mean, if if Mike Martin Jr. got this job, it was because of all the great work he done as an assistant under his father. Sure. And we sheltered, you know, the resume, and and we kind of said that all the good that had been happening in Florida State the last ten years was mainly because of Mike Martin Jr. filling in the gaps, doing two jobs. Um, so, I mean, he's had all the time to – There's there can't be any coach that's in year three of any job in any sport in this country that doesn't have more of their fingerprints, their identity in their team than Mike Martin Jr. I mean, I, I think he, I, I think the counter to that, though, and it's not a counter, it's – and Ira would back me up on this. We'll let you talk, Ira. Keep sweating there for a second outside. <laughs> we'll let you talk. Enjoy those birds. Um, is that, you know, it's one thing to be the assistant, but he wanted to change some things. He had all these dreams of how the program was going to be different under the, him because he would be the head coach. He's in charge of making all the final calls. So he had his fingerprints on the roster, but we were expecting the team to look different. Or we, we, we were told the team would look different and you would hope perform differently. And so, you, you know, it's maybe not the most fair thing to say, okay, well, he was there for 20 years. So, um, you know, he should have had, he did have more of a runway to take off for sure. But still, he didn't get to implement the things he wanted to implement. He didn't get to recruit with a full staff because, quite frankly, his dad wasn't recruiting the last 10 years. So all that stuff was stuff that was unique to him having to do all these jobs, wear all these hats. But, you know, now, like you said, I know even if we just take away the assistant part and all the, all the work he had to do before he became the head coach, he's now the head coach in year three. If you want to say it's year 23, that's fine. But it's really been his program now for three years. And that's the frustrating part is it kind of looks the exact same. Yeah. And if I could just jump in there real quick, the uh, just to emphasize what Corey's saying, um, you know, it's different when Jimbo Fisher was head coach and waiting at Florida State for football. He was one of 10 assistant coaches. So even though you had a head coach, it was kind of in one foot in a retirement. It wasn't as vi- uh, vibrant as he was earlier in his career. That's on a staff of 11 with a bunch of support staff. Baseball staffs are much smaller. You have three coaches that are full-time coaches. And Florida State basically did have one of them who did not go on the road rec- to recruit. So that hampered them for a long time. And then, as Corey said, Meade had a lot of ideas he wanted to change. We've seen the changes, for better or worse, the reliance on analytics, the shifting with the defense. Uh, there's a lot of things that they do differently than Mike Martin Sr. did. But that doesn't mean it's all going to work. It doesn't mean it's all going to work overnight. So I think he's made mistakes. I think there's been some growing pains. I think they've had to retool the roster. Uh, but what concerns me is there are – there's been clearly some misses in evaluations. I mean, they're playing guys – you know, they're playing guys that they're counting on as main players in this team that I don't know that are Florida State caliber, and I don't know that you couldn't have gotten better. So that's a concern. The development's a concern. I mean, there's a lot of reasons to be concerned. There's, there's – if you were just evaluating based on how this team played this year and what, what they did, you know, it's below average. It was not what – for what Florida State wants it to be, it was not where it needed to be. Uh, the problem is, you know, or not the problem, but I guess the the, fa- the fact of the matter is, it is year two, full seasons. Uh, the other thing, and I think Corey makes a good point of judging the regular season versus the postseason, Florida State had won that regional, somehow won that regional in advance. It doesn't mean that all the problems are gone because, again, you look at the University of Miami, they had a really good season. They got to host a regional and they got bounced in their own regional. That doesn't mean their season was a disaster. They had a really bad weekend. They didn't live up to their expectations. Florida State's been the opposite. In the sense, they didn't have a, a good season in the first place. So there's a lot of concerns. There's a lot of things they have to fix. Um, and real quick, the reason I'm outside, a little positive COVID test, can't be around the family. Just wanted to explain to people why I'm standing outside and sweating as opposed to being inside where I normally would. Uh, the family's keeping me uh, – keep, they've kicked me out of the house until I uh, get through this COVID test. Some people – 
Some people quarantine in like their own separate room. Iris family just kicked them outside. Out of the house. So it's he's, like out, the, uh, he's outside and it's a great time of the year for it. So good luck with that, it's, Ira. It's like, it's like the Flintstones. They kick me out. They, <laughs> they put the milk bottle outside. And uh, this is where I'm going to be for the next Ooh, couple Oh, boy. Days. This is like Our that last... scene, uh, Albert Brooks and Broadcast News. You got just, <laughs> you just sweat flooding down you. There's a, there's a topical reference for you guys. All right, last one before we let everybody go here, especially Iris, since he is struggling out there in the heat, man. Um, over, let me see here. What do you think is more likely, Ira, that there will be at least four different everyday players in this lineup or there will be at least one change in the assistant coaching staff? Uh, I think it's more likely to be four different players, but, but it wouldn't shock me if there's a change in the coaching staff. I mean, I just, it hasn't worked. I'm not saying it's anybody's fault. Uh, but if you're the head coach, uh, unless he can go out and get some strong support staff people as, like I said, like volunteer assistants, something like that, maybe that helps. Um, but otherwise, I mean, he's got to give, he's got to come up with some answers. He's got to come up with answers to Mike, to Michael Alford, of why it's going to be different beyond just, Oh, year three is going to be different. Uh, there's got to be something you're doing, putting into place. I hear Buster Posey's available. Corey, what do you think? Uh, more than four everyday players in that lineup or possibly a new assistant full-time coach? I don't know. I can't I can't put a, a, a percentage on that. But if there are not more than four players different in this lineup, what are we doing here? Like, what are we doing? Did he like what he saw out of that group that he had that he had there that was that was last in the ACC in scoring? I mean, clearly you got to do something. And to Ira's point, what, what's concerning or should be concerning is, you know, you lose Parker Messick and you lose. I know Bryce Hubbard wasn't good at the end of the year, but he got you a lot of wins early. You lose, uh, you know, two of your, your your two main Jonah's stars. Jonah's gone. Stars. Jonah's gone, Corey. We lose Jonah. Jonah's gone. Big, big. Could have had a better season there, Jonah, but he, he pitched great in his last game. Terrell's your only home run hitter, like pure home run hitter. He's gone. Um, so you, you've got some holes to fill and you wonder, okay, without Messick and Hubbard, to, to stabilize a rotation, what if your starting pitching is bad or just average? What, what then? So, yeah, man, there's a lot of questions. That portal, I, I just can't imagine. He must be updating that thing, like, you know, just, just refreshing his browser every, what, hour, 12 seconds? I mean, you can't let you – as soon as a name comes in there, man, you've got to reach out because he's got a lot of holes to fill and he doesn't have a lot of time to fill it. All right. Well, we'll see how it all shakes out. You'll know over at wordchant.com when it happens. For Corey and Ira Maslon, thank you for watching. Hit that thumbs up on the way out. We certainly would appreciate it. Stay connected to wordchant.com, the ultimate Seminole sports source.